thank you nalina thank you for the starting the recording um, to start uh, let me take the opportunity to welcome you to this um, second webinar for the turboclick webinar series for 2017 um, as most of you or some of you might already know we are a cross sectoral working group and we work on topics of uh, inclusive cities urban governance building resilience low carbon development and capacity development methodologies among others the cross sectoral working group uh, of course is part of tuevas and part of sector network governance asia and together we formed the turboclick uh, working group uh, the webinar series today aims at exchanging experiences and good practices among our members as well as others uh, whoever is interested this webinar will be about capacity development for urban stakeholders human organizational and institutional capacity capacities are crucial for asian countries to achieve this development objective capacity development or capacity building is one of the core activities uh, with which giz works um, as was defined by oecd we could also say state that capacity development is a process whereby people organizations and society as a whole unleash strengthen create adapt and maintain capacities over time in the current environmental as well as urban governance programs in asia one key approach is the use of trainings which are normally developed and then implemented with support of partner institutions some of the training institutions however there are several challenges in going from training programs to a sustainably enhanced capacity at an organization or institution level today we would like to present and discuss the current approaches on training and capacity development for urban stakeholders in asian programs the challenges and the success stories um, we are very happy that we could engage presenters from bangladesh philippines and indonesia today the first presentation will be by mr uh, mahmood uh, he will be presenting he will be presenting about the capacity developing development using ict tools small intervention and major outcomes a small introduction for him mr mehmudur rahman is an information and communications technology and management information systems expert he has got more than 14 years of practical experience in organizational development through optimum use of I ict resources besides his last five years experience in giz at bangladesh and cambodia he worked mostly in corporate private sector in the field of designing and implementing mis currently he is a senior advisor with adaptation of climate change into the national and local development planning project in giz bangladesh here supporting to develop and implement an information system for the planning commission of bangladesh the planning commission is the central planning body of the country and therefore determines objectives goals and strategies of long term medium and short term plans um after this we will have mr thomas hagedorn who will present about getting cities prepared for infrastructure investments cdi's integrated capacity development approach is what he will talk about mr hagedorn uh, is a capacity development specialist with cities development initiative asia Uh, posted at Philippines he is an urban and regional planner with experience in Europe Latin America and Asia during his 12 years in Buenos Aires Argentina he was responsible for the urban development division of the secretariat of municipal affairs of the federal ministry of the interior uh, teaching urban planning at the university of buenos aires and is vice president of a small argentine foundation in vienna or austria where he lived before he was responsible for the development of the vienna parster stern and salzburg central station real estate projects of the austrian railway company obb the last of the presenters would be mr nazaruddin mr nazaruddin will be presenting on climate mitigation through development of sustainable urban transport Mr. Nazur Nazuruddin is a capacity development specialist working for a 
a sustainable urban transport project, Sutri Nama, in Indonesia. He has nine years practical experience in managing training and developing training modules. In Sutri Nama project, he manages capacity development in urban transport improvement, such, uh, such as reforming bus system, parking management, and non-motorized transport, uh, pedestrian and bike lane. The project is working for the Ministry of Transport and Ministry of National Planning. But without much ado, I would request now Mr. Mehmood to take over and uh, give the first presentation. Thank you very much, Vishali. Thank you very much, all other participants. I appreciate my opportunity to be here with all of you today and to talk a little bit about the initiatives that we took here in CIZ Bangladesh and uh, the success and the lesson learned from our initiatives. Right now, I'm working for another project, but the initiative I'll be talking about is about uh, another project that is called Enhancing Urban Governance Project, which was co-funded by BMZ and the uh, Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, SDC. Uh, we implemented the project during 2013 and 15. The budget was 3 million Swiss francs. And in this project, we were working closely with 16 municipalities of the northern part of Bangladesh, mainly Rajshahi and Chapai Nawabkhand district. Before I go for telling you the story about this ICT intervention and the capacity development using ICT tools, I would like to tell a little bit about our approach. The approach we took to find what initiative we would like to take to assist those municipalities for sustainable development. In our project, we took a initiative that is very simple, but we found it very effective. We call it focused optimization management. It is very similar to a problem tree analysis. But there are some little bit different, I will tell about this. So on the left side, you can see there is a tree. At top of the tree, you can see there is a card written undesirable effects. So whenever we went to the municipalities to identify the capacity development needs of those municipalities, we did these exercises with them. The major participants were from the municipal staffs, from the public representative, and from the civil societies. So we were trying to listen from them what is their problem or what is the undesirable effect. And then we started finding out the root cause. So this exercise is very much similar to a root cause analysis that many of us already know about. But the interesting part starts when we go to the next exercise that we call the future reality. The first exercise is on current reality analysis and then it is the future reality analysis. So here we make the positive statements. We transform the current reality to positive statements like how this is the desirable effects and then instead of saying root cause, we are saying entry point. That means where we can make some intervention and we can make some change. So let me give simple example, then it may be easier for us to understand. On the left side, if you can see, the undesirable effect is Jerry's car does not work. 
and what could be the reason for that the engine does not start and the root cause can be the battery is empty it's a very simple example but in real life it is not that simple we need to make a big tree analysis to find exact root cause and then if we transform it to the future reality tree it is the positive statements from the current reality tree like jerry's car works the engine start the battery is charged and at the last you can see there is an injection point that means there is an intervention that is called a battery charger is connected so we will mainly be focusing on these injection points whenever we started discussing with uh, the municipal authority they were coming up with a lot of issues but as we all know that our resources are limited we were trying to identify the exact injection point where we can put our resources and we can get major outcome so the reason behind i am talking about this approach because this is also a part of the school capacity development <coughs> sorry capacity building initiative so this whole exercise was done with them with the municipal staffs the public representative and the civil society so by this kind of exercise we identified what are the injection points or what are the initiatives we going to take so there were lot of initiatives sorry lot of problems in uh, those particular municipality i'm not going to talk about all these let's take one that is lack of enough revenue collection and there are many reasons why the revenue collection was not adequate one of them was there are a lot of pending area water bills pending or area water bills and the reason for that is the record of pending water bills were not updated their manpower was not enough to update the water bill and the water bill software was stand alone only one person could use the water billing software and after having detail analysis we found that a very simple software with a very basic par code scanning facility could help them a lot in my whole presentation you will not exactly find find that i'm talking very big about a pure it initiative or lot about it initiative because the initiative from it is very small we gave them a very simple software and the software was printing the water bills and in the water in the bill there were barcodes and they had a barcode scanner a very simple barcode scanner that we can see in super stores and everywhere so that they can scan these barcodes and they can get the water bill information updated this is very simple intervention and it took us less than 3000 euro to complete the whole thing but the result we have got before we go for the results i would like to tell a bit story about the challenges we faced the first challenge we faced is the lack of cooperation from the municipal staffs it was beyond our expectation what happened to the staffs whenever we are trying to install the software whenever we try to implement the software every time they were getting back to us and saying that this is not working and this is problematic but when we were testing everything was fine then we were very um, you know ambiguous that what is happening over there but end of the day the senior authority of the municipality found that those staffs they were getting personal benefit from that water billing section some of the staffs were corrupted and they were taking the water bills from the citizens but they were not putting it in the laser book but they were taking the money in their pocket and that is the reason 
they were not cooperating because they felt that if the software is installed, if every record is updated, then they will lose the chance to get some extra money, illegal money from that. We were very lucky that the municipal authority took immediate action against those municipal staffs who were corrupted and then the cooperation was very good and we went through. We were trying to find a software vendor who can give support to that particular municipality even after the project period is over. So it was a bit challenging for us to find a software vendor at the local level. But we were fortunate, finally we got somebody like that. And there are huge data entry that was pending from years long, the record was not updated. So the data entry operation took uh, almost four months to be completed for 10,000 households. But after taking all this pain, not, from, not by us, by the municipal authority as well, they got nice results. They got all the pending water bill records updated. The staffs involved in the mishandling of the water bill were brought to justice. The citizens were really happy to receive regularly updated water bills. It takes very short time to scan the barcode and update the billing information. And for us, as, as uh, from GIZ, as uh, sustainability is our, is our core business, we are very happy to see that even the project is completed two years back, the municipal authority, they are not only using the software, but they themselves put some extra money to add some additional modules to the software and making it more robust because they have already seen the benefits from it. So finally, the root cause that of uh, insufficient revenue collection was addressed and they were collecting adequate revenue from this uh, water building section. So, in natural, that is the result uh, we achieved from this very small initiative. And I'd like to conclude in saying that uh, the whole approach was not only about capacity development of particular person, but also as the organizational development of that particular municipality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mehmood. Um, I would now request uh, Thomas to take over um, the next presentation. Uh, uh, post uh, the three presentations, we could have the discussion round. But in case you want some questions in the middle, you could always type it in, but we would take them later. Thomas, floor are all, all yours. Okay, thank you, Vaishali. Can you can you hear me? Hello. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, I uh, still don't see uh, the presentation for myself, and um, yeah, it's loading. So anyway, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our new uh, integrated captive approach. Now I'm, I have the presentation here. So, which is um, quite uh, new for CDIA and uh, what we aim is getting cities prepared for the infrastructure investments they will uh, receive maybe after two, two years uh, after our intervention. So, and this uh, new approach um, comes after 10 years of experience and uh, I come back a little bit later why it's so late. So let's get started. Um, I have to explain only a, in a, with some words what is CDIA. CDIA is doing um, practically two things. What we do is uh, what we call project preparatory studies, which are um, feasibility studies or uh, pre-feasibility studies or sometimes engineering studies about different uh, in urban infrastructure. Uh, issues that might be water supply, 
waste water management, drainage, solid waste, and also bus rapid transport projects, and some uh, some others. And the second thing we do is uh, cap def activities. And what we use, what we are using there, is a classical GI set approach. I would say. Uh, uh, trying to address individual levels, organizational levels, uh, society, and frameworks. And this approach, uh, CAPDEF for uh, our, our studies, uh, accompanying our studies, I see between individual and organizational level, uh, depending on, on the project. So, um, to understand um, our process, I think is quite important. So you see um, here our studies, pre-feasibility studies or project preparatory studies, which is our core activity. Uh, we don't do these studies ourselves, but we contract companies uh, who are working in the municipalities and uh, collecting all the information and uh, producing uh, this study. This study uh, later um, is linked to a financier, which might be the Asian Development Bank, which is um, uh, our partner or one of the uh, um, uh, partners here with GIZ and uh, could be also KFW or national funds. And later, the project is implemented uh, a couple of years later. And um, where you see project implementation on the right side. And uh, in this moment, um, usually, uh, the capacity development approaches start because this is a big budget. Our budget uh, for the feasibility studies uh, might be between 200,000 and 600,000 euro. And we have uh, a relatively small additional budget for capacity development uh, activities. And uh, the project implementation requires usually investments between 20 million or 100 million dollars. And uh, usually also uh, includes an amount of maybe 1% for capacity development activities. So our core activity is um, in a quite early stage when a project gets defined and uh, our consultants are working more or less six months uh, within the cities, our partner cities, and usually are them with the best contacts to the cities and not CDI itself. So this uh, sometimes is not so easy for us to deal with. The challenges. A uh, relatively short time, I mentioned, and um, six months might be enough for um, some relevant capacity development activities, but our problem is that the uh, needs of uh, capacity development are not clear from the beginning. Um, often it's not really clear which uh, kind of sector will be addressed. Uh, water supply or wastewater management or whatever. And uh, although we know uh, which sector to address, it's not very clear, okay, which is um, a, a short-term uh, capacity development approach we could uh, find. So what we do is, um, or doing ourselves a little uh, capacity needs assessment, um, which might be done through ourselves or uh, through the uh, consulting company we hired, or um, could be also that we simply trust in our in our uh, partners, which could be um, here in Manila, we had partners in the Ministry of Transport, for example, who uh, know how the municipalities are working here, and uh, they helped us to design a capacity development approach for that project. Uh, the approaches could be sometimes a little bit more holistic. They could be, uh, or 
uh, oriented more um, in the planning sector, I would say. They could be also more technical uh, and uh, infrastructure sector oriented, and they could uh, address also uh, organizational development issues. So that depends um, a little bit on project and uh, the, the setting uh, where we are working. So when we are organizing capacity development activities, um, the municipalities, are, they do not always have the organizational structures uh, that we need. And um, just to uh, tell you an example, in Manila, uh, one of the projects uh, we are uh, probably doing, we did not start yet, is uh, a study for a BRT, a bus rapid transit uh, system. And uh, the municipalities, there are five uh, municipalities with, within Metro Manila, Manila uh, um, uh, affected. And um, usually you would work with the transport department of the municipality, but out of the five, only two have some kind of transport departments. And so you don't ha really have uh, uh, people with a background knowledge um, in some municipalities. And um, yeah, that makes it very difficult to, to find uh, uh, people to, uh, yeah, our beneficiaries for the capacity development activities. Uh, but we need people uh, uh, who know the project and who uh, 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 work for our project studies because we need data, we need contacts, and we need uh, more uh, detailed information on, on uh, territorial uh, issues in, within the territory of uh, the municipalities. So, there are very heterogeneous groups of uh, participants regarding the knowledge and also the institutional settings. And um, we also have sometimes a very low influence on the selection of the participants. Uh, so as you can imagine, there are some people who might um, be some yeah, a certain kind of expert in transport planning, and other people um, we invited in, in that, uh, that case, people from the planning departments, um, not really experts in um, transport and some technical uh, aspects of transport planning. So, and um, yeah, there we have short time only for the um, capacity needs uh, evaluation, and then we have to organize within the short time, usually um, yeah, a seminar or workshop consisting of two days, three days um, of uh, quite intensive work. So the goals are um, quite similar to goals in every capacity development approach, I think. It's uh, to install uh, knowledge and skills. In our case, uh, related always to the topic of uh, our study. Sometimes or, uh, in, with a more holistic uh, approach could be um, a little bit different. And uh, we want to know our uh, partners for the studies. So uh, these um, uh, capacity development workshops are always a good a good uh, time to getting to get to know them uh, better. We also want them to motivate them to implement uh, some improvements after the workshops and the trainings. And um, we are usually inviting uh, different levels of governments or institutions, um, so from the uh, federal level or regional level and municipalities. Municipalities is our uh, focus partner, but anyway, uh, we might find uh, other partners which are useful to share uh, the workshops. 
and um, yeah, build relations with the partner institution. Those sex, uh, soft factors uh, are very important uh, to us, um, and yeah, they can rise the motivation to, for the cooperation of uh, the people with very important knowledge for us. So this is uh, a scheme just to show you, um, okay, there are several steps um, um, how we plan and that from uh, first contacts until uh, implementing uh, a first workshop or a second workshop, um, yeah, it takes some time to organize everything and um, yeah, all or everything has to be done within more or less six months. So about the approach, the GIZ approach, I already mentioned that it's uh, quite uh, classical. And um, yeah, just to mention, uh, we cannot accompany all of our studies with uh, capacity development measures because we have more or less 15 studies per year. And uh, this year we have um, three capacity um, measures for, for three projects, and um, which is, yeah, maybe only a few, and it could be a little bit more, but it depends on the budget and also on the project, whether it's uh, useful and we think uh, um, here or there it could be better to uh, to uh, work with some capacity development measures and in other cases maybe not. Uh, we are quite flexible um, with our measures, um, for example, in the uh, capacity development approach. We started before our uh, feasibility study, and um, yeah, this has some reasons. I will tell you a little bit later. And um, yeah, the needs assessment uh, must be um, very flexible. We don't have always time to visit uh, cities in different countries and to to evaluate. Okay, what's uh, what are the issues uh, we should address? We trust usually in our um, uh, hired uh, companies. Um, also in national ministry partners or we have uh, stakeholders or national partner organizations and we consult them and uh, to find out, okay, uh, our impression is uh, that uh, the municipalities want to address more or less uh, more organizational issues or more technical issues and whatever. Then what we always do is concentrate on the low-hanging fruit, so uh, keep it simple and not too complex. And um, we want to hire usually consultants um, from the countries themselves because uh, English is um, a, an issue in uh, many Asian countries, not in the Philippines, um, but uh, in Cambodia where we had this, this year an intervention. Uh, nobody speaks really English, so we have to find a national consultant who speaks English um, and uh, has the technical knowledge and uh, uh, also quality of, of teacher. Uh, so, and um, of course, in many countries there are GIZ uh, offices, and we ask our colleagues, and we also always get support uh, from them, uh, use their structures and experience. Uh, the costs, um, usually we expect uh, from our partners, that could be uh, the cities we are working or the ministries, national ministries, um, uh, uh, some contributions. Uh, these contributions uh, is usually not really money, but um, yeah, this is important for us um, with the ownership principle, and uh, everybody should uh, yeah participate in a little bit and uh, organizing a venue or 
uh, pay uh, the travel cost or the travel costs themselves or whatever. We are very flexible, but we usually don't want to pay everything ourselves. Uh, we want to see uh, also uh, a certain offer from our partners. And uh, the different approaches, um, the budget we have for each uh, city we are working is very different. Sometimes it's enough uh, 10,000 euros, sometimes we need 50,000 euros. Depends yeah, very much on the setting. And evaluation. Um, what we do to evaluate our ac activities is um, uh, asking the participants after the training itself uh, just some uh, standard questions. This is a sheet uh, consisting of 10 questions. And um, yeah, I am sometimes uh, quite skeptical because the results of uh, those answers are not are not differing uh, so much time. So um, people usually uh, are very happy with the um, uh, interventions, and they give us uh, quite good ratings. But uh, what I'm really interested in is hearing some critiques, but we don't. So much critique. So a little bit more interesting for us is uh, a second evaluation. We have three months after each training, and uh, this evaluation is asking our participants uh, also what uh, they did uh, within their uh, organizational structure with the knowledge and the skills uh, they uh, got taught in the trainings. And uh, the answers that they give in that second evaluation um, is a little bit more qualitative, um, I would say, and it's also relevant for our indicators. Thomas, you have two more minutes. Two more minutes. OK, so um, I'm getting to the end then. Um, in 2017, I already mentioned that we had uh, only three interventions, or we will have. They are um, not finished yet. One in Tunles Up in Cambodia. This is a, a wastewater management uh, study um, we have this year in five municipalities in Cambodia. Um, Every, every, all of them uh, close to the Tunnelis Up uh, River. And um, yeah, the other one, uh, I mentioned the Metro Manila, five municipalities in Metro Manila affected by a BRT, a bus rapid transport uh, route. And uh, this is an upcoming study. This has not started yet. And another. Another uh, study uh, which already started, uh, but the capacity activities did not start yet, is in Kaili in China. This is a, a transport hub, a PPP model um, yeah, for uh, tourism purposes. And uh, there are always some photos here from the trainings in uh, Cambodia. And um, yeah, I will not tell you uh, too much about that. Maybe uh, another experience here in Manila. Interesting was uh, our participants. We don't have always too much influence who are our participants. So in Manila, for example, we had uh, 17 people on our participants list on the day before uh, the training started. And uh, uh, then the day of the training, we had over 60 people participating there. And it was also um, important to invite national level and regulation bodies, municipality level employees, and people from the donor community, because here in that project is complex setting that nobody uh, is talking with each other, but everybody is expecting something from the other. So there we needed also some time just uh, uh, for the communication between the representatives of uh, the national government and the municipalities. 
a good idea was to invite a trainer from Latin America. And I think um, yeah, with the Philippine culture and the Latin American cultural background are very, or maybe not very uh, similar, but uh, our evaluation was that uh, the trainer from Latin America, he could understand uh, very well all those issues about um, uh, formal and informal um, problems uh, within uh, Manila here uh, with his experience from Bogota. And um, yeah, he also was um, available to for the Ministry of Transport for an extra session, uh, which uh, yeah, was something like a coaching uh, of the uh, leading board of that ministry, some uh, undersecretaries and directors for um, their future projects. So uh, this is just to say uh, the capacity development uh, uh, approach is uh, addressed usually to the municipalities, but the benefits uh, are um, not only on this level, but Other government levels or in some other institute uh, to finish and uh, thank and talk later. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. That was a very insightful presentation. Uh, with that, I would request Nazaruddin to take over and uh, give his presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Faisali. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for having me here. And here I would like to actually my project is a new project that we are preparing here in, in uh, Indonesia. And I will uh, introduce quickly about the project we have here. And in terms of uh, capacity development, I will very much bring the experience from previous project we have uh, in um, four city in uh, Indonesia. So um, the project we are preparing right now is, uh, is called um, Nama Sutri. It's a sustainable urban transport project uh, funded by three different um, funding partners, which is um, Nama Facilities and Kambi MUB there and um, the British government and then SECO, the Swiss government. So the project is mixing between the um, technical assistance and interestingly, it's a financial component in that. So the project is supporting Ministry of Transport to develop um, their urban transport uh, plan. And sorry, okay. So the activity of the project is um, uh, basically, the main activity is a, a bus uh, rapid transit development and non-motorized transport, and this includes pedestrians and bike lanes and a parking management. So the project measures is, um, is implementing in both level, national level and city level, and in national level is very much about institutional setup and regulatory framework and then we implement those three activities um, in the uh, seven cities. Um, for capacity development approach, basically those two projects have similarities because the previous project also work uh, uh, within uh, those three activities, but different cities. And first, the main thing is the trainings. Uh, they, like we developed some uh, module or toolkit together with the Ministry of Planning and Ministry of um, Transport. And those toolkit we train to different cities, not only the cities um, under our pilot cities, but also different cities. And the second one is um, Inspired Champions. Um, and this is a very important, as uh, Thomas has said, from uh, Latin America as well, where Reforming public transport is always uh, make um, the official, the government, um, not really confident to do that because they need to know how other people do, of course. And we, uh, back then, we invite Enrique 
Arnold Losa, if you are familiar with him, he was um, uh, the mayor of Bogota, which really successfully transformed the city with the uh, BRT, um, bus rapid transit. And uh, very often as well, we bring um, um, authority or head of a transport agency from one city to other city. Or when we have a training, we brought them as a, of the best uh, practice and uh, like he can share how um, uh, he's afford um, bringing the idea to the mayor, for example, or bringing the idea, getting attention from the parliament, getting more um, uh, budget from the parliament. And these are always very, very uh, successful. And the third one is a study tour um, uh, for um, uh, parking management, for example. People, um, we brought people to uh, Korea or to Singapore to see this how um, non motorized transport work, like bike line and uh, this pedestrian. And see, in the previous project, we had uh, we set up national forums. This forum is especially for transport authorities where um, annually set up by the Ministry of Transport, they had a forum for uh, head of a transport agency from all cities around Indonesia. And some cities have a chance to, pre to present what, is, uh, what they have done and, and what is the uh, uh, successful story they have or what challenge they have overcome, for example. And they can learn from other uh, cities and also they also can bring, um, in this case, for example, they can bring the uh, parliament uh, member to other city to see or to discuss with the parliament. Um, and then the next one is a foreign expert working at local agency. In this case, uh, we will have a BRT expert um, who will be placed in the city and working together uh, with the uh, local authorities and, and this of course under our uh, programs like in line with our activity. And, and then we do also well like procuring for consultant consultant on behalf of local authority. Um, in this case how they they uh, design the BRT or how they design these um, pedestrians for example and the very often we procure um, a, who, a consultant uh, who had ex much experience in India, for example, or had done a very good job in China. So that also um, uh, the one that is very, what well, I think that also part of the approach is a very useful approach. And the last one, we have a project team house at a local agency, like a part of the project. And they work together with the local agency or the transport agency. And um, they start there from beginning of the project until the end of the project. Then um, in terms of challenge, um, that what the very happen, happen is, uh, often happen is a rotation of trained staff. So we had a, a training, we trained a um, key person at the um, a transport authority. And then suddenly in the next month, like he got a new job and then achieved to other department even. It's not only in the transport, but to planning uh, department, for example. And that is a very, very uh, often happened in, in the city. And, and then a different priority of new elected governments. Reforming bus system, it always about changing the social life of people in the city. And the oppositions of politic, political opposition, they always bring what is people suffer at the time. And people and those candidates, they when they come or they campaign for the office, they always bring what is the bad or what is the situations uh, at the um, at the current government. In this case is a current uh, existing um, bus uh, uh, system, like a, a trans system, a trans existing a transit system, where the driver, for example, or the bus owner, they will um, demonstrate or going to rally every day. And, and again, the uh, system that the current government preparing in this BRT system. And the challenge for project team as a main in the city, uh, what we found is a project team, they are the one who drive the implement the project. And, and then uh, post-training impact as well. Two lessons learned that I highlight here for a project team, when we finish the last project and, and then we don't see any uh, sustainability from that project, 
you know, because everything is by the team. We hired local local staff, but they are not working for the government, they are working for our project, and then when they are finished, and then we cannot see their sustainability from that, sustainability from that uh, activity anymore. So what we learned that for the project, for the next project we are preparing right now, we will not have any uh, team in the city. Of course, it would be some uh, challenge it's coming, but we think that what we will get, uh, the development we will get is would be more sustained than having quick development, but we will not see the sustainability from that. And the post-training impact, this is interesting, um, then we learn after, well, after, like we have six training and we learn after three trainings, and then afterward, in the trainings module, we have a case study. For example, when they design um, uh, BRT line, for example, and we don't take um, a case from outside anymore, or we don't take case from the module anymore, but more we prepare the training longer, taking case from the specific city. So then that would make more realistic for people where we make a group, then the case studies is came from one of the city from, from the training. Also, usually we have a, like a three different case study from the real case study. And then um, afterward, we make um, a monitoring plan and monitoring plan we agreed with, um, with the participant after training. The, uh, the project team, like our team, will go to the city and to see uh, how this uh, training could uh, impact their uh, daily work or these, um, the program, the city programs in general. And the success story from those measures that uh, having project team has a direct access to decision maker. Um, because the team is uh, in the city and they work closely with the head of a um, transport agency and also they are very close with the mayor as well. So when we have something like uh, we have a visitor from, from Germany, for example, it's very easy to go to the city, very easy to meet the mayor and and for them is very familiar with the project and familiar with all those sustainability terms, you know. So that what we found is this, um, is um, a success story for having team in the city. And also um, it has a significant change after the study tour and inspired champion. And when we brought them to uh, uh, to Singapore, for example, to see how a parking system of uh, me, me, parking meter work, for example, then it immediately can, uh, how to say, like they brought to their um, uh, a system, you know, like they proposed for the next year a program, for example, to implement more uh, the program, uh, like what the one, how it worked in Singapore, for example, and inspired champion. And this is a, um, uh, very important during the um, national forum where people share the experience and share how they overcome with the um, um, a challenge to, to pursue it or to convince the uh, uh, mayor, for example, to convince the um, uh, parliament um, to bring more budget to develop um, urban transport. And then it's like, this is from National Forum. Uh, now it's become a platform for transport agency in Indonesia. So whatever they have, they always, they, they would be like a the platform where the transport agency will bring and then also they also eager to promote what they have done in the city. Or we said like so-called like a show off forum. So we need, uh, um, the city, they want to show something new or they want to show that they have done better than the city. Um, on the other hand, also other city also can be inspired by, 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 by other city as well through that forum. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Nazaruddin. With that, we uh, come to the conclusion of the three presentations. Um, since nobody has put in any questions, I would request you to uh, uh, either, you know, start feeding in your questions. Best is if you could feed in. Uh, but, you know, 
just as an icebreaker. Um, There's one technical problem. I can't see the presentation. Lucy, uh, Nalina, can you handle this one, please? The presentation has got closed somehow. Okay, thank you. So, so maybe by you know, uh, uh, till till we get more questions. I had a couple of questions, starting with uh, um, with Mahmood. Uh, that was a fantastic, uh, you know, intervention through ICT that you showed, and uh, you know, I had one on the on the project as such to to just ask whether um, um, how much was the real time that you took to implement uh, your, your your intervention. And how much was the struggle time? Because usually there's a lot of struggle time for all of us. So how much was the time that you took in convincing, you know, uh, the municipality and the staff and everything? And then how much was the real real time that you took for the intervention? So that is uh, the first question. And uh, there's another question then, then related. Um, how would you see capacity uh, development, uh, you know, um, areas when it comes to ICT. What other areas could you see as, as easy, low-hanging fruits for uh, capacity development for ICT? Thank you very much, Vishali, uh, for very nice question. Uh, first one, I would like to answer like uh, how much time we needed to implement the thing. Uh, we all through it took like uh, I think more than a year to implement the whole thing but that includes the whole preparation and convincing and blah 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 all these things but the actual implementation it took uh, around uh, four to five months to implement this thing and uh, to answer to another question about the, the potential areas uh, of capacity development using ICT tools and then the limitations. Uh, through my experience, I have found that there is a gap between the ICT, if we call ICT world or development world, something like this. So there is a gap between the, these two areas uh, because the ICT world, they are always talking about you know state of the art technology, what is coming new and all this stuff. But in the development world, when we were working in the developing countries, in most of the cases, I found that the latest or state-of-the-art technology is not required for this kind of, uh, for handling these kind of issues. So the gap I found that uh, there should be some, some person or some institute play as an intermediating role between the ICT industry and uh, the, the authorities, the municipal authorities or developing authorities that needs the support. So that is the area I found as a challenge and also that is the most potential area because the example I have given, like only a barcode scanner and a barcode scanning software was very much helpful for them when the barcode has started, you know, invented, you know, uh, I don't know, 20 years back or 30 years back. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I think I totally agree with you. Sometimes the tiniest of the things uh, are the ones that we really need to promote when it comes to urban local bodies, especially also with, the, with their capacities and uh, uh, knowing very well that if it's simple, it'll sustain. Yes. So I have two. Qu I would. Uh, Nazaruddin says that he has two questions. Maybe uh, Nazaruddin, you could come in yeah. with your questions. All right. Thank you very much. Um, actually, um, the one that Mahmoud, uh, the chairman that he presented, is very much close to the project that I have done uh, quite some time ago. 
Um, my question here is the lack of cooperation for municipal staff. Um, what we learn here, like reforming always costs extra work for the staff, right? Then um, you always, they, they don't, they, they are not happy to work more because always they have to learn more and they have to, for example, in terms of uh, software, when they have or to learn more and then have to do more work for that soft, uh, data entry, for example. Um, my question is, did you um, put this conditions um, with the staff uh, remuneration in a way with their superior, for example, where they do more work, like to more to make uh, the the process attractive for them, or did you arrange a special arrangement with their superior? Uh, will they get more uh, incentive if they stay longer in the office, for example, or they, will they get more incentive if they took that training or this uh, software training? Um, and how was the data entries? Um, had been done. I mean, like, who did uh, enter the data? Because for us, last time we hired, it's like 50 students, university students, to enter all data because we reform uh, one big hospital from paper based uh, management system to electronic system, you know, so we have to enter everything uh, at the same time, last time. Right, so this is the first question. My second question is to um, Thomas. Um, we are working um, on developing urban transport here in always lack of investment. My question is how, if I met the city where, uh, who are interested to develop the project that is close to your uh, mandate here, how could they approach CDIA here in, in Indonesia or somewhere? I mean, like, who should be contacted? And in the future, my project also develops sustainable urban mobility plans. And I just uh, learned from your presentation in Manila, you set up this, um, um, these plans. And I think um, later I need to uh, get in touch personally with you to learn more about this um, arrangement because we will uh, do a national um, mobility plan and also urban mobility plan, the plan in our project later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nazaruddin. So maybe, Mahmoud, you could take the first question, and then, Thomas, you could take the second. Thank you very much, uh, Nazaruddin, for your question. Uh, first one is, uh, what was their motivation to, to help us implement the software when it is an extra work for them? Uh, those staffs who were really wanted to have this thing settled, they they were in a very big mess. You know, they they were unable to produce the software bill, uh, sorry, the, the water bill on time, and it was a big mess. So they were really motivated from themselves to have the software and have the things in place, and uh, to reduce the extra work for them. We actually hired some you know casual staff for data entry that that part was outsourced so they did not have any extra burden to have the data entry and all all they did is they received the training uh, and they start implementing and as i mentioned earlier that the software vendor was from that locality they were based in that municipality so they were very much uh, helpful for them and they were giving them uh, on the job training, whenever they needed any support, even after implementation, they were just calling those guys and they were coming up and things were, things were very, uh, going very smoothly. Thank you. Thanks, so, Matthew. hello. Yes. Thomas, yes, please. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, Vaishali, um, I interrupt you. Um, hi, Nasruddin. Uh, to get in contact with us is quite easy. But, um, uh, emails, because in Indonesia, which is one of our um, most important countries, we have a national 
arbeiten will, ist PTSMI, die National um, Infrastructure Investment Company. Uh, and um, we share with them two times a year a training about um, linking to finance, which ha deals with uh, public-private partnerships approaches and financial modeling and project formulation. So um, if you have some municipalities interested in contact uh, CDIA, I would suggest to, inv um, to let us know who is it and we would invite them to uh, one of these trainings and they should come with a project idea and um, uh, within the training, which is usually about um, three days, uh, they uh, can present their project idea and um, our country manager will be there and uh, he will have some talks with them and um, will also know, okay, this is a project which um, might be interesting or rational for us to follow up or or maybe not. So we had one case in Singapore this year with a municipality from Indonesia. Uh, we invited them because they were recommended uh, by a regional organization, I think it was CityNet, and uh, they got in contact in Singapore during five days. Um, a good practice workshop we had there with our country manager and um, uh, now they are working on their uh, applicant forms for uh, a CDIA study. So this is yeah, maybe the best way to get in contact. But anyway, it's also possible to write emails, but the personal contact is better. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so we have a couple of questions here now in the chat. Uh, there is one, uh, there are two from Shalendra. So one is for you, Thomas, where he's asking for the capacity needs assessment report, including methodology used for the study, if that could be shared. And the other is for uh, Nasruddin from Indonesia. So uh, what Shailendra is saying, I hope I've understood it correctly, that there's no project team in the city. However, uh, there's a success story of the project team uh, that has a direct access to the mayor. So this probably is not clear from the presentation, so if we could clarify. So Thomas, if you would want to say something, otherwise we move to Nasruddin. Uh, yes, um, I could share the documents about the capacity needs assessment, which is more a formal uh, needs assessment we did in Cambodia. We did it ourselves. Then in uh, Manila, it's an assessment um, yeah, in a written form made by the uh, uh, the Department of Transport or Ministry of Transport here in the Philippines. And in uh, Kaili, um, yeah, I can also send the uh, assessment report. They are quite short and um, not very extensive. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think that's also interesting for, for me as well. So we'll just put in our email IDs in the chat and then maybe you could send it across. Thanks. So, Nasruddin, would you want to take that question? Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, the project team is a very good, I mean, like, it was many good thing and also many bad thing as well, which I didn't explain the bad thing. Um, the good thing is that we have a direct access to the mayor and also we have um, uh, it's easy to communicate with high level official. Um, the not good thing is um, where uh, the project team is very much influenced by uh, the counterpart. So many activity they, they did is more like urgent activity that is required by counterpart. In the end, the project team didn't achieve uh, many indicator of the project. So they had a very good job, but um, we found out then when we have a team in the city, um, the team is too... Uh, too much close with the uh, uh, with the government, and then like they did many um, they support many activities not related to our project, and that is um, uh, the argument is always the request from the the mayor for example you know here we cannot say no with the mayor, then uh, if they have one uh, activity in the city like the city activity for example a sport um, event. 
and they just ask um, the project team to work on their uh, program. And this is very much what they need, but in the end, like we didn't achieve much our indicator um, um, for the city. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one question from Daniel for Mehmood. Uh, um, so I will just read it out probably. I'm not a 90 person, so also complex for me. So what he says, it uh, says is congrats to you and the team. It sounds like a nice success story. Um, the, the casual trees you presented, causal trees you presented were linear by nature. For complex issues, causal loop diagrams tend to provide a more in vivo or natural picture of the complexity. Was the linear model sufficient in this case and why? And who found the solution about the software and scanners and project teams or local or both? And what does this mean for capacity building and specifically third order learning and how to uh, how to learn creating adaptive capacities? So all yours. Thank you very much. It's really interesting to see uh, these very interesting questions coming up. Uh, first of all, uh, the trees, uh, the example I have uh, shown, it seems linear because I have only shown I have only shown the linear linear one, but the real one is not linear. It cannot handle complex issue with linear kind of thing. Uh, it grows like real tree and it can grow really big. So I did not I did not show you the actual exercise that we did. Otherwise, it could not have been fitting in the screen. So you have to do like very big tree analysis over there. And um, the solution, uh, your question about who found the solution about the software and scanner, it is us, the team and also the local. Because whenever we went into deep, what is the problem? As I told uh, during my presentation is that the, they had a software earlier, but that was a standalone. Only one person could use the software at a time and he or she has to update the water bill like for 10,000 household per month. And he or she had to enter the data by using his keyboard and mouse. And it was not humanly possible to enter the data of 10,000 households per month for one person. And then we all were discussing in a group work and then it came up our mind that we can simply have three copies of the bills and in each copy, on each copy there should be a barcode and whenever the citizen is paying the bill in the bank and submitting the receipt to the municipality, that water billing guy can only scan tuck, 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 and the software should have been updated. So it was a joint um, effort to find what um, things we can implement to reduce the state. And as we are talking about this, um, uh, what does it mean for capacity building and specifically the specific Okay, so in the whole project, we were doing exercise, we give it a name called um, Capacity Development Need Assessment, CDNA. We call it CDNA. And we did a series of exercise together with the municipal staffs, the civil society, and the public representatives. And throughout these Capacity Development Need Assessment exercises, we actually found what are the needs for that particular municipality to address the issues they are facing. Thank you. Thank you, Mehmood. I think that kind of clarifies a lot of things for us. I have a question here from Frederike, who's sitting with me. Yes, hello. I'm here in India, and I'm working for the Inclusive Cities Partnership Program. And in the moment, we are trying to implement um, also our CD strategy and we want to have some comprehensive city plans and one issue what we figured out that we need a lot of cooperation and communication between different partners. So one big issue is for us um, a soft skill training. So I would like to know if anybody of the participants has some kind of experience with this kind of capacity development.
I mean, for us, important is like we have different levels. Also, we have from the state side and from the municipality side. So there's one question, how do we bring the different actors together? And then also the next question, um, in the moment we are thinking about to keep it rather detached from the technical parts and try to get more into the communication. How, how do you rather have a cautious communication? How do you bring different teams together? And on this level, is there any experience available? So you're basically talking about a non-technical training, but more on the behavioral aspects and the communication aspects of the officers. The, exactly. The I mean, it is connected to our topic, and they know all what we are talking about and what should be the final aim. But it should be rather focusing on the soft skills. OK. I don't know, uh, since there's silence, I don't know if I have. Yeah, there's, uh, there are two people. Yeah, please, Nasruddin, you could speak. And maybe uh, Hamidul, if you would want to speak. OK. Um, I, I'm i not really sure with the soft skill, though. But in terms of communications, I think it depends on how the government works. In Indonesia, it's very much top-down uh, communication approach, where if you want to go to the ministry, you have to go to the uh, like high level first, and then they will uh, okay, it's like a disposition or direct to the lower level. And what we did, for example, um, when we want to bring the minister, like different ministry together, like we invite high level um, official, like Esalon, I don't know if it's work in another country, we call it Esalon 2 like it's the third level under the minister, um, we invite um, them, like it's not much, so it's like around six people, and then we bring our topic, and then uh, ask the idea and their contributions. And of course, like everything is based on the um, um, national medium plan they have. You want to accelerate the development, for example, and then from that meeting, then we make um, like a bigger workshop afterward, and if we need to invite the high level in the city, then we start inviting high level in the city. But this is based on the discussion we had uh, from uh, the ministry, uh, different um, um, ministry level. So how, how this approach that we do in Indonesia. Yeah. OK, thanks, Nasr uh, Nasruddin. And uh, Ronnie, would you say something? Um, yes, can you hear? Yeah. Okay, um, just to give an answer about our two different experiences of what we had during 2009 and 2012, we were working on a uh, uh, municipal development plan exercise, uh, which was basically to bring the municipal officials so with the communities and discuss uh, uh, how a Poroshava development plan could look like, a strategy planning that was aiming for 20 years plus. Um, and then there were the standard procedures. You had a visioning exercise, you did some baseline surveys, then you have a lot of data, you hired a lot of consultants to come in, and then uh, standard trainings. At the end of the day, there was a very good big document, maybe around 300 to 500 pages. Um, at the end of the day, nobody was looking at them after six months. And the government has a standard uh, project activities. so. These things was already giving us a foot for thought, like if this uh, inclusive city approach that we undertook together with the government of Bangladesh was really useful or not. Um, that uh, really then took us uh, some time to devise, okay, how much improvements we can bring and the new innovations can we bring in. So in 2013, when we had a, a co-finance from Swiss Development Corporation, where we had a, a more funding, uh, so we partnered together directly with the Ministry of Local Government, and we said, hey, uh, let us see then if we can go for more tailor-made approach. Mahmoud mentioned this uh, capacity development needs assessment, the CDN approach there. Uh, it was derived from the uh, um, theory of uh, changes, and then you see, we adopted that to the local situation. 
and we found that as there is a quite a vast gap between the um, um, national level policies and the local implementation level. So we, we deliberately excluded the national level uh, interventions there and we focused on the how city corporations can work together with the communities and different key stakeholders. So we were started with our, our, our stakeholder analysis and I strongly recommend everybody that uh, of course, this is a stakeholder analysis is now has become a standard tool, but this can be very useful if you can put some conflict diagram into it. And, and, and that brings us a lot of results. And, and, and then this result was helping us to find out really which specific needs a community has and which things the city needs to really understand and put it into their budget. Uh, and this helped us really to, to see like if how the city budget can also be linked with this uh, community level planning. If I have the money to do it or if I have a human resource to do it where I need to improve. Uh, and these ex experiences is available. I would strongly say uh, we will be very happy if somebody of you is, is really, uh, no more details, so I'm not going to share today because of the time, but we will be very happy to share you uh, our these experiences. And now I also can say that uh, we are also working on a new methodology right now. Uh, and, and this methodology, uh, we, we, we can also share. There is a video is coming in very soon and we hope to put it into YouTube, our GIZ official channel. Um, and this is, uh, we, we, we call it as a, as a participatory community development process, PCDP, which is linked with the specific community needs and how this can link with the city budget together. And I think for, for Frederick, is, it would be quite uh, interesting maybe for you and maybe we can talk bilaterally if you have, uh, if you want to know more about that. Yeah. I. Sorry, I think Frederica agrees. She will get in touch with you bilaterally. Uh, Thomas wanted to say something about his experience from Argentina. Thomas? Um, yes, uh, I would like to also, I think it's um, uh, partly maybe not political correct, um, but um, we had some uh, participation, participatory projects in Argentina, and Argentina is a very heterogeneous country. You have uh, Central Argentina, which is a quite modern and open society, which requires uh, participation from institutions and also from uh, people living in the neighborhoods. And uh, then you have uh, Northern Argentina, which is, um, yeah, uh, a little bit backward. And this is uh, another type of society more uh, with a feudal um, heritage and uh, a very autocratic and top-down um, oriented political system and which also works uh, as a society in this way. And we had different approaches in those uh, different regions because uh, in northern Argentina it was almost impossible when we are, were uh, working on uh, the planning level, not on the project level, this is different, uh, to get people involved uh, and to participate. We did not get really response. So, uh, when we were uh, um, in certain municipalities um, um, for planning issues in central Argentina, we always invited uh, the local institutions and uh, also some um, NGOs and whatever. Uh, and people who were interested. And uh, we finally did not so in the north of Argentina because it did not really work. The project level uh, is different. If you are working um, in a neighborhood improving uh, infrastructure or whatever, also in the north of Argentina, you have to work with the community, with the people living there to find out, okay, what's really what they, what they need. Uh, but on the planning level in Argentina, this participation um, did not work out. So this is my experience. And um, resuming, uh, okay, have a look how is the society um, uh, yeah, uh, 
how is the society like in your uh, in the place or in the country you are working with and accept those uh, structures although they might be autocratic or whatever but for your uh, issues it's um, it's important okay sounds interesting and uh, nice to know about your experience uh, michael has also given some of his uh, experience from uh, Lviv, uh, Ukraine, um, and maybe in case Frederike wants to know more or somebody else, he's also given his email ID uh, later. Uh, there's uh, Advitya who's uh, given one question for any of you. Now, how can we incentivize the personnel who are taking additional responsibility to maintain data within a ULB? So to make him or her motivated, if it is difficult to pay them any further financial remuneration. So if you have any experiences, uh, especially maybe Mahmood, if you could tell us. Uh, it's a tricky question. And uh, also I know that many of us also face the same problem. Um, <clears throat> So for me, it is a matter of um, making those person understood that um, it is it is maybe an extra work for the time being, but end of the day, it will be helpful for their regular work. And yes, like this, because uh, any financial enumeration or other kind of pay, we from the asset side actually cannot do. So. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Mahmood. And I think I will echo your uh, sentiments because ultimately, if you're looking at sustainability, that sustenance has to come from within the organization. And uh, we, we should not expect an external like GIZ to take on that incentive because the moment we shift out, uh, the building would basically collapse. So the system would fail. So, but uh, I think with that, we've also come uh, over short our time also. And uh, I would really thank all of you for such active participation and to all the three speakers who uh, have contributed so actively to the entire session and given such excellent feedback. And we look forward to being uh, staying in touch with you. Maybe some of the participants will also get back to you uh, individually. So thank you so much and uh, with that we will say bye bye and we stop the recording uh, for this session and uh, if uh, Lucy um, uh, do we have a feedback plan just now or later yes um, we kindly ask the uh, presenters if we could stay five minutes um, in the chat we would do a, a short debriefing afterwards